I'm curious to hear, why didn't you like making wedding invites as a designer? This is probably kind of controversial, but brides are the worst people in the world. Are you an RV person? Or are you just RV life curious, wondering how people live in a tiny space with their family 24-7? Either way, this is a podcast for you. My name is Kate White, and I travel full-time with my family and two kids and the dog in an RV. Every week, I sit down with a fellow RV woman to learn why she chose RV life and how she has changed on the road. Pull a chair up to the fire, and let's chat. Hello, my friends and fellow RV queens. This is Kate White, your host, coming at you from Northern Michigan. Ah. (laughs) I think that's the second time that I've sang Michigan during an intro. So just sorry about that. Today, I got the great honor of meeting and chatting with Renee Howie. And her transformation story is very stark, going from being an army veteran, uh, living a very structured, I would say, um, American life, you know, in the house, dual career family, had some changes in health concerns and all that kind of stuff that led them to really consider living in an RV full time. And let me tell you, like, the freedom and just kind of like nature loving aura of this woman is truly inspiring. They have two young kids and they have this homeschool story where um, they used to be all stressed out about following specific curriculum. And they kind of threw that out the window and started, came up with their own phrase of freedom schooling. They are stationary right now and grow a garden outside of their RV and they're helping start a campground in South Dakota. I mean, so many cool things about this family, especially toward the end of the conversation, me and Renee just kind of let the hair down (laughs) and uh, act like old friends. So I really enjoyed this conversation. I think you will too. Let's get into it. Hello, Renee, and welcome to the RV Queens podcast. How are you today? Hello, I'm so good. Good. Where are you right now? We're in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Ooh, I've heard it's beautiful there. Is it, does it live up to the hype? Oh, yes. (laughs) And are you guys just traveling through or are you stationary for a while? We are stationary at the time being my husband took a position with his cousin, being the on-site manager at his cousin's new campground. I love hearing about new campgrounds popping up because it feels like there are not enough because all of them are packed full. So hooray, new campground. (laughs) Well, I'm excited to dive into your story today because, you know, a lot of, most of the guests on the podcast have a transformation story that I'm like trying to pull out, you know, like what was their life before? What are they doing now? And yours is like very stark from (laughs) what I know. Like uh, I I call it like your Clark Kent persona was kind of like (laughs) a highly educated army vet, you know, living in a big house with your family. And like now you're Superman. This is kind of a spoiler alert. alert, So sorry, (laughs) listeners. But like, now you're like an essential oil mama with a garden and just like totally all natural and you live in an RV. Like to me, those are like polar opposites, you know? Uh, so there's a lot to cover today. Um, and I would like to start back in the day with like, why did you join the military? Tell me that story. I, from the time I was like 10 and I had been out in California and seen Apache helicopters, I decided I was going to be an Apache pilot because that's normal. (laughs) And uh, are you from a military family? Was this like a, you know, everyone's doing that kind of thing? Not really. My stepfather is a Marine, um, but I wasn't very much influenced by him in my life until then when I was out to visit. And I actually told him I was going to fly it. And he shook his head and said, you're a girl. (laughs) (laughs) That's either going to shut you down or it's going to give you more backbone than you knew you had. And it sounds like it gave you the push that <laughs> to go in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So what was your story kind of like graduate high school, go right into the military or what was that? How did that unfold for you? Two weeks before graduating high school, decided to not go to college and to go out to California and 
see what happened. <laughs> and so I was in art school, kiddo, young one. <laughs> and then um, I s- started studying aviation in school and a recruiter got a hold of me and said, hey, if you want to be a pilot, you should probably join the army. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And then you were hooked. And so I joined the military as an unmanned operator. So I flew drones and then I got LASIK surgery so that I, well, PRK surgery so I could be, go through flight school. And just before I dropped my packet, I was discharged for PTSD. What does drop your packet mean? (laughs) The way that I was going to go into flight school was enlisted soldier to warrant officer. And so to do that, you have to prepare a packet um, proving that you are capable and that you're awesome and intelligent and would be a successful officer. And then the diagnosis (laughs) hit. Ah, that's too bad. So how many years was that part of your life? I was in the military for three and a half. And then on the outside, I worked with the military for like another three, I think. Okay. And where on that path did you meet your husband and start a family and all that? We met at Fort Hood when we were both in the military in 2006. I got out of the military in 2008. He got out in 2010. We got married in 13. Oh, nice. That's a nice long relationship there. So, I mean, (laughs) you were in the military and then your husband... Did he become a police officer or something like that after? He was military. Then we both did civilian sector of what we were doing in the military. We got laid off after I had brain surgery. And uh, so he decided to go to school and become a police officer. Wait, you had brain surgery in the middle of all this? (laughs) This is a lot. I know. It's kind of crazy. Like when I really spit out my story all fast and everything, it sounds insane. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, what I was getting at when I asked if your husband was a police officer is like, you know, having these very structured backgrounds with these professions that are very in the box and hierarchical. um, At what point were you guys kind of like boundary pushers? Did that happen while you were in those professions because living in an RV is like an out of the box life. That's why I started this podcast and it's, you know, there's, tell me about that transition. Was that already kind of like in your personality or did that kind of like push the envelope spirit come later? I was always a boundary pusher, always very rebellious, kind of rogue. (laughs) My husband is not at all, still not. When he was at the police department, it was just constantly like, this isn't for us. This is a lot of stress. This is a lot of you gone all the time, me worried all the time, and it's not fun. And I don't like things that aren't fun. (laughs) So I convinced him and I've always been really good at convincing him of doing crazy things. Seems like that's maybe like the yin and yang of your relationship is, you know... (laughs) Totally. Why it works, right? Okay, cool. Tell me about planning to move into an RV. Like, how did you, what was the progression from your husband's a police officer? You make these plans to live in an RV. Why? What happened? The original idea came when we had no money, zero dollars in our bank account. We got government assistance. Life was hard. (laughs) And we had come from these really cushy corporate jobs. So we had already known what it was like to have kind of an abundant lifestyle. And I'm just like trying to figure out how we were going to make it work. And I brought it up to my husband. Hey, people do this. Can you believe it? And then we laughed about it. Like, that's crazy. (laughs) No way. Then his aunt passed away. And I had a couple situations where doctors mentioned the word cancer. And it was my health was just like roller coaster. And I said, we just can't guarantee tomorrow. And how are we going to 
make sure that we instill legacy in our kids if we're always chasing the next dollar to figure out how we're going to afford our house (laughs) and food in their bellies. That was kind of the, okay, let's make it work. Why RVing specifically over like just downsizing and living small? We were stuck in Utah because that's where we had been with our government jobs. We had family in multiple states. I love travel. I want to see the whole world. (laughs) And we hated Utah. So it was kind of like, well, we could move somewhere else and he could be a police officer somewhere else. Or we could just scratch that idea and try something new. Okay, so I have to bring up that you are a young living person. And by the way, I'm obsessed with Ninja Red, our chiropractor back home, introduced us to it. And it's like my kid's little tradition now for listeners that don't know what ninja red is um (laughs) how about i attempt to give a description and then you can correct where i'm wrong so basically there's this uh section of china called ninja and they have these wolf berries there which have some kind of like really super foody like magical properties where the people that live in this area grow old but don't need glasses and they don't walk with canes and they and they live to be super old and and they attribute the population's health to these wolf berries that just are everywhere so they so young living has like this really concentrated like um it's a juice and we we like have these little juice pouches that we freeze so the kids think they're pop uh popsicles and they're really high in antioxidants and vitamin k a i don't know all the vitamins uh how much did i just butcher that description no that's beautiful that's like truly accurate (laughs) (laughs) i brought this wasn't supposed to be a young living commercial but like we love it in our house and um i noticed that you're a young living person too and you make it seem really like authentic and genuine online you know like i used to do network marketing (laughs) back in the day for like six months i was not very good at it and so i've learned to like spot people that i'm like oh you're drinking the juice because you're like trying to sell it but you're like you're like this is your life man like i love (laughs) seeing someone that's like authentically all about the brand okay so the reason i'm going off on this tangent um is because there have been several women I've met on the road or even on the podcast that do or used to do a network marketing business while they're traveling full time. So I'm curious to hear from you, like, how does this work for you on a day to day level of running your business plus homeschooling plus the logistics of, you know, RV life. What does that look like for you? I don't like to say that I work in the pockets of time because I feel like that's such a cliche network marketers like sell. (laughs) But I kind of do. I just send the kids outside and make a reel or heck, I'm outside watching them making a reel or making a post. Not totally unschoolers, but kind of lean a little bit more that towards that philosophy with homeschool. So it doesn't require a lot of like sit down book work, uh, which makes it easier for me to be a little hands off with the kids. The hubs is always gone right now (laughs) because he's working and managing the campground. And so it's just kind of us and we just let the rhythms of the day be gentle. I need to get things done for work. Then I find ways to interest them in other things like hey, why don't you go check for caterpillars in the garden or or various things like that? And they're always excited. How old are your kids? I have a seven and a half and a four year old. And then I was going to ask about the homeschooling approach because I read that you kind of let go of the curriculum based homeschooling for now and you started doing what you call freedom schooling. So what is freedom schooling and why did you make that shift? When we first started homeschooling, it was when my daughter was preschool age. And at that time, I had the mindset that homeschool had to be school at home. So we did all the testing to make sure she was in the right levels and got all the curriculums and it was like hours a day and 
for a (laughs) three-year-old. And it was intense and it was like stressful for everybody. And we were all just like crying all the time. But I learned in watching her that she would get so excited about talking about the things she was interested in and she'd want to learn more. And then she'd start having conversations with even like adults um, about all the things she was interested in. And I realized she was really learning a lot outside of what I was teaching her. But then they would do the quizzy thing that a lot of like skeptical people do to homeschoolers. Like, how do you spell your name? What's the alphabet? What's five plus five, you know? And she was like, I don't know. I'm like, maybe we're just like pushing her too hard in this curriculum stuff. And we need to like put a little more effort in the other. And that's when she really started lighting up a lot more and just like finding joy in learning. So, yeah, I love that. I think kids are totally just sponges and we are kind of like guides to help them. Like, let's keep learning. Like, let's keep growing. You know, it's not something that they have to sit down and and (laughs) sit on their butts and learn all day, you know. Uh, And I've heard that from a lot of homeschool moms on this podcast too of like when you start out we're all stressed about not messing our kids up right and teaching them everything they need to need to learn and getting the right curriculum for their age and blah 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 all these things and then a lot of our v moms gravitate towards this approach of like they're naturally curious like they're naturally learning about things as we go like let's help facilitate the learning that's already happening for them and (laughs) and i love that you gave it your own name of freedom schooling that's the best <laughs> you should probably trade well, by us i think a lot of people do the unschooling and i wouldn't say we're true traditional unschoolers because i feel that there are some things that i can teach our kids better if i use a curriculum things they're interested in even you know so we do use curriculum as needed but we have the freedom to do what works for them uh, what curriculum have you found that works for the ages they're at right now. We are doing a homeopathy class together as a family. So that's kind of neat. It's another one of those hippy dippy things (laughs) similar to like essential oils, but it's using certain aspects of a plant to kind of force the body to react to that part of the plant to build a stronger immunity. I don't know if that's like the best way to explain it. For instance, right now I've been having a lot of pain and inflammation. So I'm taking a certain homeopathy that um, comes from poison ivy. And so it's training my body to respond to the inflammation by introducing a certain aspect, I guess. (laughs) That's why we're learning. (laughs) Where did you find a program where you and the kids could like go through that together? That seems cool. I'm going to butcher her name. Paleo Brown. I need to look that up and I can do that for you if you'd like. But she created this curriculum and it's for children and you can go through it as an adult. She has different like resources that you can add on to learn at different levels and things like that. I met your family at the full-time families event in Madison and your daughter had a stand with bracelets and I'm actually wearing one of them right now. They were so cute. Oh, I'm going to tell her. Yeah. Oh, man. And there was a lot of jewelry there made by kids. This was like a, a kid's business fair, right? That was the only bracelet I bought that day. And that's all I'll say about the jewelry selection. <laughs> because your daughter was like truly cute. And like, I really wanted to wear what she made. If you know what I mean about children's Aww, business, but God yeah, bless them. My so kids sweet. are right there too, selling their stuff. So I'm not trying to smack talk. Anyways. So with the business that you run and your daughter, like having the opportunity to run a little, you know, a business at that event is, is business ownership, um, a hot topic a passion for your family? I owned my own business. I was a graphic designer for wedding stationery and I hated it. My father and his brothers and my grandmother and my aunt, sorry, um, have owned a business for 50 years. So it's definitely kind of in our blood. (laughs) But I also think that there's ways to enjoy life while not being a business owner too. Something we want our children to see and witness and be a part of 
but not something I'll ever be like, you have to do this to be happy (laughs) or anything like that. (laughs) Okay. So I was a graphic designer back in the day as well. And designing, like doing lettering and stuff for wedding invites, I was never good at that kind of thing. Um, I was more like the web design side of let me make the thing for you. So I'm curious to hear, why didn't you like making wedding invites as a designer? This is probably kind of controversial, but brides are the worst people in the world. (laughs) (laughs) The best. Please tell me more about how you feel about that. Oh, my gosh. Like, I was working for some really incredible people, like people getting married in Italy and St. Croix and like all these like destination weddings and it was a lot of fun when it was fun man there were a lot of brides that just hated life (laughs) let's just say it was a good thing I had contracts (laughs) you know stress is like money like it's just gonna accentuate who you already are (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for sure for sure getting married is a very stressful time <laughs> yeah but yeah that would be that would definitely be a challenge i see what you're saying about that whenever you think back to renee like pre-rv life when your husband was a police officer and you lived in the big old house and you think of renee now What has changed? I was depressed and I was lonely and I didn't feel like I had purpose. It was literally, how am I going to get through today? What am I going to do today between this morning and the time Hubs comes home? Because, man, that just feels miserable. (laughs) Sorry, it was a lot of just like counting down, waiting. and Was it the travel (laughs) that's unlocked you or what do you think has made that much of a change for you? I think the travel, I think our family's philosophy and focus has changed a lot. We are now very focused on our family as a team instead of kind of the traditional like mom and dad, kids. Kind of, I feel like there's kind of a separation. The kids go do this and they live their life. The adults need, I don't know, self care and mommy wine and like 8 million like distractions to get through life. And it turns out maybe we just need to slow down. Work in the garden together a little bit. Get a little dirty. (laughs) So you're stationary while right now, while your husband's working at this campground and helping start the campground, it sounds like. And are you able to raise a garden while you're stationary? We're doing it. (laughs) That is the best. So it is his cousin's campground. And I said, hey, Um, You have this field and it's useless. Like you're not making money on it. (laughs) There's no campers there. Um, Can I just dig it up? (laughs) He's like, sure, I guess. Good luck. (laughs) So we pulled all the sod. It was 25 by 50 feet. Built an enormous fence to keep the deer out and then planted. And then had hailstorms and floods and all the things. (laughs) But... We're eating vegetables from our garden. Oh, that feels so good. What all did you plant? Tomatoes and radish and squash, all kinds of squash and corn and the little mini watermelons and mini pumpkins and everything. (laughs) So our seven and a half year old, she was part of the garden we had in Utah uh, when we had a house there, but it was a horrible garden. (laughs) It had a lot of invasive weeds that would never go away no matter how many times we weeded so it wasn't a lot of fun but she would go out there and pull all the herbs and just sit there and eat herbs all day so okay nice so it sounds like you had some travel time with your rv life and now you're have several months where you're stationary and you're growing a garden um is this life Living with your family of four, and you have a dog, right? We have two. Two dogs. <laughs> like, you're living in this small space now. Is this RV life what you expected it to be? It is, but it's also way more. Like, we didn't really anticipate all the ways we would grow and find joy. We just kind of expected we'd travel and see the world and meet people. 
but we didn't know what it was going to do to our family. And in that regard, it's just been so much more than we ever dreamed of. Um, Okay, so I am going to do a rapid fire series of questions for you, if that's okay. And then, okay. and then I have a couple of like wrap up questions for you. Are you sweating yet? Just kidding. I am. It's very hot in this room. Can you tell like my face is all shiny? <laughs> okay, here we go. Number one, what is your favorite essential oil? Peace and calming. I have that one on my diffuser right now. Oh, that's so good. I have it on me. <laughs> What is your favorite plant? I don't know. That's so hard. My favorite flower? Daisy. Daisy is my favorite flower. What is your favorite movie? I don't watch movies. Did you used to have one? I mean, no. Okay. So I used to watch from time to time, but it was more like husband was really into Marvel. So we'd go and watch Marvel movies. I'm not really like big into it I never really was and then now I haven't really even watched tv in like seven years are you are you a (laughs) book person this wasn't even on my rapid fire but now I'm just curious (laughs) I'm sorry. Yes. So what is your favorite book? I do a lot of like personal development and learning style books. Right now I'm reading um, Love Him Well, which is a really cool book about loving your husband, even through the difficulties of life. Maybe we should all read that one. (laughs) Oh, man, I could go on a long tangent about nonfiction books, but I'm going to save that for another day. Uh, Okay, what is your favorite food? Oh, pasta. Everything pasta. Uh, Do you do homemade (laughs) pasta? Yes, sourdough pasta. (laughs) You guys send me that recipe. I'm a sourdough person. Yes. Okay, what do you do for me time? Lately, I've been going to the sauna. Uh, What is your biggest pet peeve? I really have a problem when children have illnesses or chronic conditions and their parents accept traditional Western medicine without considering holistic approaches. It sounds really judgy. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, I mean, I want to, I feel like you have a lot of um, deep heartfelt opinions about things and I'm trying to like draw them out of you as we go. So I kind of do. I'm a very opinionated person. (laughs) Let it rip. You don't have to hold yourself back. Okay. Have you ever driven the toy hauler? Yes, I have. It was awesome. It was so cool. You're talking to someone who's driven a bulldozer and an excavator. <laughs> Flying like, what are they called? RPA drones or whatever for the military. So <laughs> you got this. I was like, I need to learn to do it because I want to be comfortable in case there's an emergency. Like, what if my husband breaks his leg? <laughs> I don't even know. Like, I don't want to think about it. But what am I going to do? Just learn to drive right there in the second panic mode? <laughs> probably not a good idea glad that you said that because i totally have those thoughts too of like we don't have a toy hauler we just have like a 41 foot fifth wheel but i've never driven it i'm really nervous about it but i have these thoughts like what if drew has a heart attack or like god forbid any like horrible thing and then it would be like me and the kids and i'd have to figure out what to do i probably need to learn how to drive this thing but i just Go find a back road in the country somewhere and just pull it. Like you don't even have to like turn it or any of that. Just pull it. What I feel a little bit. I feel like the best starting place for me would be like if we're on an interstate and it's like slow traffic and it's just like a straight shot. Okay. There's nothing crazy going on and pull off the road, switch drivers. And then I can just like, Get it on the highway. Like, maybe pull off on an exit. I don't know. Do it. (laughs) Do it. That would be the best. Yes. What's an essential oil for, like, anxiety? Because that's what I need to do. Peace and calming. (laughs) Peace and calming. Obviously. (laughs) You just (laughs) plug the diffuser right into our truck and just have it spraying in my face the whole time. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Such good ideas going on today. All right. Last question of our rapid fire. If you had to pick a new place to settle down right now, where would it be? I don't know. (laughs) Probably Eastern Tennessee. We lived in Tennessee. We did Savannah, 
Tennessee, Nashville, and Knoxville. It would not be Nashville. I hate Nashville. I was actually going to ask that because you seem like someone that might hate Nashville. I've never heard of Savannah. (laughs) It has like maybe a thousand people. Have you been to Cleveland, Tennessee outside of Chattanooga? No, I don't know if I've been to Chattanooga either. Chattanooga. How do you pronounce it? Chattanooga? Chattanooga. I don't really know. You know, like Chattanooga (laughs) choo-choo. We did visit like the Smoky Mountains. That was really pretty. All right. So you're a mountain girl. I like it. Okay. Um, what is next for you and your family over the upcoming year? We are heading to Michigan in November because that makes a lot of sense. It's going to be chilly. <laughs> and then Florida for the winter. And then we'll be back here to help again next season. You have family in Michigan for November? I do. Yeah. So I actually met you in March, which a wonder that you found me to be a pleasant person. Uh, My little brother had passed in January. Part of this lifestyle is being able to see family a whole lot more. And we realized that we weren't doing that. And so I said, well, that's what we're doing this for. So let's do it. We're going to go freeze our butts off in Michigan. <laughs> are you, uh, you going to be there like around Thanksgiving and holidays and stuff? Are you staying that late? Yeah, we're, we're thinking we'll stay until just after Thanksgiving. Uh, have you been to, are you from Michigan? Like, do you know where you're going here? Oh, yeah. It's, it's miserable. <laughs> we're actually in northern Michigan right now and the what su- part? in the summer we're in Traverse City that's my home oh my gosh dude I should have said that at the beginning of this conversation I have to tell you we actually fell in love with Petoskey like I, unexpected oh, beautiful and I just it's a small town we kind of went up there on a fluke because we were trying to like buy time waiting for this RV repair and blah blah, blah. it's a long story but we got up there and we're like what is this beautiful little town? Like, it's, why is no one talking about this place? Yeah. So. It's absolutely stunning and wonderful. Winter is miserable. But, you know, <laughs> we're from Nebraska. So I understand a win- uh, miserable winter. But, like, at least you guys have, like, ski hills. Like, there's stuff to do here in the winter. If you aren't allergic to snow. That's me. <laughs> and by allergic, you mean you hate it super bad. Yeah. Like, I find it incredibly awful i hate being cold it's got to be 77 to 93 v life is probably good for you then because you can kind of like follow the 70s wherever you want to go that's a good tip i like it um i don't usually ask this question but are there any other thoughts or revelations that you want to share with listeners who might be considering rv life i hear a lot about people saying RV life is cheap. I also hear a lot about people saying RV life is expensive. We have been able to stick to our budget, except in two areas, fuel and food. The difference in cost everywhere in the country is so great. You better double your budget or triple it. (laughs) But outside of that, like those are things you'd buy in a regular house or a regular lifestyle. So outside of that, I feel like you can budget really well, but those two things are difficult. Well, and you seem like someone that probably uh, buys higher quality food, I would guess. Maybe like... I am a food snob. Like, yeah. When we're down in Florida, we drive an hour and a half one way and then back once a week to get raw milk. (laughs) and raw cheese and all of that do mostly organic we do very very little packaged or processed food you probably don't eat like um the bad oils like seed oils and stuff like that we have a few hard lines in our house and seed oils and food dyes are like top of that list (laughs) and you make your own bread mostly (laughs) there are some places i'll trust but i'm an ingredient reader so If it's got more than four ingredients, it's not bread. (laughs) So whenever you guys have traveled through small towns that are kind of like food deserts, what do you do as far as uh, finding higher quality foods for your family? We stock up before. We really love Costco 
not so much Sam's Club. We have a freezer full of meat and we just do our very best. We do um, order food from Azure or Az- Azure. I'm not sure how to say that. So they have a lot of like organic foods, a lot of things that are aligned with our family's like food values. So we can do that, but they're only once a month and you have to like go meet a semi truck in a back alley somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> totally normal. <laughs> uh, we use a lot of websites like uh, finerawmilk.com and things like that to help us find local farmers and things like that. We eat similar. Um, and a lot of the women on the podcast that I've talked to and women that I've met in real life, RV life, it surprises me how many other families eat this way on the road or like a lot of gluten-free families that we've met on the road. Um, And like, first of all, it surprises me because I think, you know, I don't know about you, but before we started living in an RV, there's just like this stereotype of like, yeah, you know, like uncle Eddie and his family, like live in the RV, you know? (laughs) And it's like, like you said, people think it's like a really cheap way to live and all that kind of stuff. There's just like this whole stereotype about it. But the but the actual families that we've met on the road are they're really intentional about their family life. And mm-hmm. that's a big part of why they started living in an RV together and traveling. So number one. And then I can see how that intentionality like spreads to every area of their life, right? Including food. Um, and that's been yeah. like a hugely surprising <laughs> like finding of mine on the road. Has that been your experience as well? It has. In fact, I really love so many, so many families will do where we'll like, Hey, let's all have dinner together. Bring your own dinner because there's just such a like understanding that every family has their intentional, like food priorities. And it's just so neat to come together and still have that community and that like eating and nourishing together, but also to see everybody being so intentional about the food they are bringing. The woman that I got um, our sourdough starter from was, they're like a part-time RV family. So they live stationary part of the year in Oklahoma on land, and then they travel during the winters. And uh, we met at TTO, and she's like one of those bright light personalities, Amber, if you're listening, hello. Uh, and she was just like, they were staying on B field and she was like inviting everyone over for dinner and like, all you know, one of those people. So we started talking and uh, she gave me a sourdough starter and like some starter recipes. And so uh, they had to leave before we did. And so I was texting her about like, okay, like what kind of flowers, like the, the <laughs> what kind of flowers am I supposed to use here? Um, Cause I wanted to, I don't know, like buy the best kind of flour for the sourdough bread. And she goes, so we grow our own oats and I make my own oat flour (laughs) for our sourdough bread. And I'm like, dude, give me some ingredients I can get from like (laughs) the store down the street. Cause not every RV person can just like grow their own oats, sister. Come on. Uh, So it's a challenge, but I tell that story to say like, that's not really an exception. I've met so many families that are just really kind of like holistic and, you know, yeah, intentional about food. So Heck, we have a, a tower garden and I pretend like it's like the coolest thing in the world. We actually haven't grown anything in it, <laughs> but we're figuring it out and it's like going to travel with us and then we're going to grow our food in a garden during the winter but in our house how wait what is it is this one of those like water garden things or like it has soil yeah it's hydroponic it's got a big basin and then a big pole and the things grow and do you have to like put nutrients in the water or something like that you do have to put minerals like once every couple weeks or so you're gonna have to engineer something to like make sure it doesn't (laughs) fall over that's what bunks are for they just come down and they like kind of squash on the top (laughs) we have my daughter is like um trying to keep a strawberry plant alive i'm like 
I love it. I love that she wants to do it, but it's like honestly kind of dying, which is making me sad, but I don't know how to help her. Anyways, the point of what I'm saying is the way that we deal with this big old plant thingy on travel days um, is we turn one of our, our, we have little stools um, for our, you know, kitchen counter thing. We turn it on its side and it just so happens to be the right square for this pot to like fit in. And I'm like, I really want to support this gardening thing that she's learning, but I don't know how we're going to travel with all this because <laughs> it's the only living plant we have. <laughs> all the other plants around here are fake. So I just kind of like shove them in cabinets on our travel days. The shower works really well for our live plants. Oh, that's a good idea. Duh. I'm going to take a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have one more question for you, Renee, and then I'm going to have you tell everyone how they can connect with you online. Okay. Um, the slogan for this show is a podcast about unexpected riches. And I would love for you to share with us what is the unexpected richness that you have found from RV life? Our family first, no doubt. Our family, we, I don't know how to say it. Like we're a different group of people than when we started. We are kinder and more loving and gentle to each other. We get along a lot better. We enjoy each other a lot more. Definitely our family. And isn't that funny how it's like kind of counterintuitive? It's yeah. before you live in a small space with your family, you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to be with them 24 seven in a small space. But the more you're with each other, like the closer you get. <laughs> I mean, that's why we laughed when I first came up with the idea. Let's live in an RV. Yeah, right. We could never do that. That's insane. Like, that small of a space? Laughable. Well, thank you so much for being on today. Will you please share with our listeners where they can connect with you online? Yes. So our family account on Instagram is follow those rogues, R-O-G-U-E-S, and then, and that's all adventures and all the stuff we're doing. And then I have an account myself for more crunchy mama stuff. <laughs> and that's those oily rogues. Good stuff. And that's where you can learn more about Ninja Red and all the essential oils. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate your time today. I will see you Thank on the road. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thanks for listening to the RV Queens podcast. If you would like to be on a guest on the show, click on the link in the show notes to the guest application. And if you would also, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and like the video. That would help us out a lot. Thanks a lot. And I will see you on the road. I love Michigan so much. <laughs>